All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Pat Kane, uh, Public Programs Manager in the Museum and Education Department at the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Um, and I want to thank you again for joining us uh, uh, this evening as we continue a special speaker series virtually. Um, and in just a few short moments, um, I will bring on Julie Pride to present tonight's program, uh, History of the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District. Before we get into tonight's program, uh, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items, promote some upcoming programs, and say some thank yous. Um, so tonight, um, we're unable to have an on-screen um, American Sign Language interpreter as we've had for some of our recent programs. Uh, I'd like to apologize for that. Um, however, um, they're not perfect, but I would welcome you to toggle the automatic closed captions on for tonight um, if you wish. Again, they're not going to be the most perfect narration of tonight's program, but uh, you can do that on Facebook or YouTube, uh, wherever you may be watching tonight. I'll work to have an ASL interpreter for our next virtual program. Um, uh, Museum of Grand Prairie, if you've never heard about us, um, opened originally in 1968 as the Early American Museum, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Um, we're part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, which is a collection of uh, seven forest preserves here in Champaign County in East Central Illinois. Um, also includes educational facilities such as the Museum of the Grand Prairie and the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, uh, multi-purpose uh, Kickapoo Rail Trail, um, and uh, uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, and so much more. So uh, check out uh, Champaign County Forest Preserve District if you're local here in East Central Illinois. Um, in fulfillment of our district's mission to protect Champaign County's natural and cultural resources and inspire people to care for, enjoy, and explore their natural world, uh, the Champaign County Forest Preserve District recognizes its responsibility to acknowledge those Native peoples who came before us on this land. Uh, we currently work to preserve and tell the story of the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Miami, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi Nations. Uh, Native Americans shape the landscape that the Forest Preserve District sits within, and we must recognize that this that the Forest Preserves occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the people as previously mentioned, and that they were the first stewards of the land. It's necessary for us to acknowledge these Native nations, to work with them, and to continue to steward land and educate the public with honor and respect. Uh, CCFPD will work to be inclusive of all differences and keep Native peoples and their history at the core of our efforts. Um, this program tonight is one of many programs, as I mentioned before, in a special speaker series. Um, and uh, it began earlier this summer um, when we opened up uh, our, our newest exhibit at the Museum of the Grand Prairie titled A History of Healing, Infectious Diseases and Community Responses to Defeat Them. Um, the exhibit focuses on the local and worldwide impact of such diseases as the 1918 flu, smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, polio, typhoid, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19. Um, in addition to examining the impact disease has had on our health and well-being, uh, the exhibit highlights particular instances in the past as well as the present where local citizens came together during previous epidemics and pandemics for the betterment of their communities. Uh, we encourage all to come visit this special exhibit at our museum uh, where our current fall hours um, have the museum open every day from 1 to 5 p.m. And as always, admission to the museum is free. Um, I did want to um, let you know about some upcoming programs in the series and some things happening at the museum. Um, so uh, uh, our next program in the series will stream, a, a much like tonight's program, on our Facebook and YouTube pages at 7 o'clock on Thursday, September 29th, one week from tonight where Dr. Natalie Lira, um, Assistant Professor of Latina Latino Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign will present the program titled, They Never Ask You, They Just Tell You After It's Done, a program about sterilization, abuse, and histories of resistance. Um, uh, the following night on Friday, September 30th at the museum, uh, we will be hosting uh, an unveiling of our Healing Hearts Collage, which has been a, a community art collection where we collected art over the course of the summer or pieces uh, that um, represented various uh, pandemics that are currently um, uh, uh, that we're currently facing here in central Illinois. Um, so greatly appreciated the public's response to that. And we had local artist Cindy Sampson put together a collage that we'll be unveiling 
at the museum that night. And that will happen from 5.30 to 7 o'clock at the Museum of the Grand Prairie in Muhammad, Illinois, uh, that opening of the collage. Another program in the virtual series on Wednesday, October 5th um, uh, at 7 p.m. on our Facebook and YouTube pages, uh, Gina Roxas, uh, a citizen of the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation and program director for Trickster, Trickster Cultural Center in Schaumburg, um, Illinois, will present the program titled Healing Plants, Native American Connections to Nature for Health and Healing. And then one last program to promote in the series um, on Tuesday, October 18th, Dr. Lynn Curry, uh, Professor Emerita of History at Eastern Illinois University, will present uh, the program titled Kids and Germs, Child Health Reform in the Early 20th Century. Um, for updates on those programs, more info on all programs within the series, as well as what's happening throughout the museum uh, and Forest Preserve District, I encourage you to find us on social media or visit museumthegrandprairie.org. Um, uh, as I have in the banner at the bottom of the screen, always love to see where folks are tuning in from. So let us know where you're watching from by typing that down in the comment section below. Um, uh, we have uh, Susan who's chimed in watching from uh, Northern Michigan. So um, let us know where you're tuning in from tonight, whether you're watching this live or potentially watching it recorded. Love to see where folks are tuning in from. Also, should you have any questions over the course of tonight's program, put those down in the comment section and we'll have a short Q&A at the end of the program. Okay, enough of me talking. Uh, you guys didn't come here to hear me talk the entire night. So um, we're gonna jump into tonight's program and I'm gonna bring on our presenter for this evening's program, uh, Julie Pride. Hey, Julie, how you doing? Good, how are you? Um, I, I'm well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, uh, mm -hmm. presenting tonight. I also wanted to thank uh, Julie. Julie has been a big supporter and a huge help with uh, our, our, our uh, exhibit, A History of Healing, that I mentioned that we opened over the course of the summer. So really appreciate the support of local public health department and Julie and her team um, in putting on that exhibit, and as well as a, no a number of other things and ways that we've linked up um, over the last couple of years. Um, so I'm going to introduce Julie, um, and then Julie, I will turn the show over to you. So um, Julie A. Pride is a licensed social worker and a certified public health administrator. Uh, she serves as public health administrator of Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, CUPHD, um, and a uh, nationally accredited health department. Uh, Ms. Pride earned her master's of social work from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and her master's of public health from, from the University of Illinois Springfield. Additionally, she has participated in Mid-America Public Health Leadership Institute at the University of Illinois Chicago um, Epidemiology in Action course um, through Emory University and the CDC and the Kresge Foundation's Emerging Leaders in Public Health Cohort. Uh, she has been published in professional journals and presented at national conferences on topics related to public health. Uh, Ms. Pride began her career at CUPHD in 1995, working with the HIV AIDS program. She served as the director of the Division of Infectious Disease Prevention and Management at CUPHD until 2007, when she was appointed as public health administrator. Ms. Pride serves in advisory roles to the UIUC School of Social Work, UIUC College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences, College of ACES, and the YMCA's New American Welcome Center. So without further ado, um, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Julie Pride. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here tonight and um, give you a little overview of what it is that we do at Public Health. Okay. Oops. Is my little thing not moving? There we go. Uh, the mission of Champaign-Urbana Public Health District is to improve the health, safety, and well-being of the community through prevention, education, collaboration, and regulation. Um, we have been around since 1937 here in Champaign. We're one of the oldest ones in Illinois, and we are also a public health district as opposed to a public health department. Um, so we're not a county health department, um, but we are one of three districts in the state. Um, so what is public health? For, for people who don't know what public health is, and there are a lot of them, probably fewer now that COVID has happened, but um, we do a lot of things. Uh, when, when you eat or drink, uh, you take the safety and uh, your food and water for granted, which is not always the case when, when we travel to 
to other locations in the world. Um, but this is because of public health laws, longstanding public health laws in the US, and the inspectors are doing thousands of inspections each year. Um, when there's in Champaign County, when there's a birth or death in someone's family, um, I am actually the registrar and I will sign the, the birth and death certificates as some people may have noticed. And then we of course keep track of that, the, that data and, and get it to the state. Um, when you need confidential STD or HIV testing, you can come to our clinic to get tested and treated. Um, these, this was traditionally started at public health departments because back when there was a lot more stigma associated with, with sexually transmitted diseases and certainly with HIV in the beginning, uh, we needed to have places where people could feel more comfortable coming uh, without having a face-to-face -face sometimes with their own doctor. When you have questions, concerns, or concerns about the environment, about bed bugs, mosquitoes, zombie apocalypse, uh, you know, anything that affects humans, animals, or the environment, uh, you can call public health. If we don't know it, we can connect you with someone who does. So what we are not at Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, we are not public medicine. So public health is not public medicine. Um, the, our federally qualified health center in Champaign is, we have two actually, we have Francis Nelson Health Center, also known as Promise, and we have the Community Health Partnership, which is located in our building as well. We are not a convenient care. So if you injure yourself or you have a sore throat or you you know don't feel well, you don't come here um, for that. You go to one of the other places in town, Carl, Christy, OSF, Francis Nelson. And we are not a social service agency, although we certainly do have programs that are much like social services and we connect really closely with lots of programs here in the community. We're also not a free clinic. And although a lot of the services that we provide are at no cost to individuals, they're not primary care services. So we have Avicenna Health Center, which is actually located in the east wing of our building here, and Champaign County uh, Christian Health Center are two examples of free clinics. So this is what um, Champaign-Urbana Public Health District was started to do in 1937. So the main goals to start public health back then were venereal disease control. Um, I don't know who's on this uh, presentation, but I recently talked to uh, medical students at, at the U of I and found out that they had never heard of venereal disease. So that's how old uh, I am. It's that is actually sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. Also started for milk inspections because back then there was no... Um, you know, milk inspection. There was no um, way to for people to know if the the food or the um, milk that they were getting uh, had anything in it, any pathogens that could cause you know tuberculosis or uh, enteric pathogens or make them sick. So that's how that's how it all began here. And while I really would love to know the history of how that started, uh, I don't have it. And I would, I would love to know. What I do know is it was started by a group of concerned women in the community. So, you know, maybe the Museum of the Grand Prairie can find that out for us at some point. Um, the other reason why we don't have a lot of, of things around that, that we would normally hope to have is that public health suffered a fire in, I believe it was around 1982, and um, that they lost the they lost their facility and a lot of the stuff in it. This is the first uh, public health department you can see here, and then it we have been in numerous buildings in the community um, since then. So this is kind of what we do. Well, it is what we do now. These are the services that we do, and they they are for all. Um, in wellness and health promotion, we have a children children and teen dental clinic. We do school sealants tobacco education, sexual health education. Um, I mentioned vital records, maternal and child health. We have the WIC program, which a lot of people are, know about. We do absolute lots and lots of childhood immunizations, lead screenings, um, teen and adult services, which used to also be called the Division of Infectious Disease. They have um, HIV counseling and testing, family planning services, communicable disease surveillance, um, Narcan, we can uh, train people on and get provide them with Narcan so that they can prevent a, a, 
overdose, and then environmental health that does the things, the restaurant inspections, um, private sewage and well permits. Uh, we do radon testing. They have the West Nile virus uh, surveillance project and um, mitigation. So they go and they ride around on bicycles and drop uh, larvicidal briquettes into storm basins all over, or storm sewer basins all over uh, Champaign-Urbana and Savoy. So that is kind of where we are now. And over the years, this has changed drastically because public health, we try never to duplicate services, but we try to come in to, and do things that, that are needed, um, that are not being done. Part of our job is assurance to make sure that, that things are, are being done. And um, so that's, that's why it changes over the years based on which diseases are around, um, you know, what things, what things are needed. So these are some of the, the greatest public health achievements in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that this, these were public health um, interventions. Public health interventions have saved more lives than, than medicine uh, combined. And you can see what some of them are. Um, it's vaccination. Uh, OSHA sprang out of uh, public health, you know, safer work, safer and healthier food, um, motor vehicle safety, control of infectious diseases, declines from coronary heart disease and stroke, family planning, recognition of tobacco as a health hazard and all that followed with that, um, healthier mothers and babies, everything from, you know, initially home nurses visiting homes to talk with mothers and, and help them out with babies, and then fluoridation of drinking water. So those are really the 10 largest overarching public health achievements. And you can see by looking at these that many of them are now run by much bigger agencies um, that have the rules and, and then pass it down sometimes to the local levels to do, do the actual you know, work of it. So um, those are the big things that we do. I'm gonna go over some definitions now to tell you um, in case I'm using these words in a minute, when I talk about uh, some of the diseases that we deal with, I came from the division of infectious disease. So that is always going to be my favorite. I can't help it. Um, I started out in HIV AIDS and I am just absolutely fascinated by all of the things that we do in public health. So, okay. When I talk about pathogens, that's going to be any disease causing organism. So there are five main types viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and worms or helminths. And so you know that um, all of those clearly have different um, strategies that we have to do to look for them and to mitigate them. Endemic means when a pathogen is still exists in the community, but becomes manageable. So um, things that started out as uh, pandemics or as epidemics now are endemic, meaning that they're here and that we have um, outbreaks of them rather than it's just constant like we are seeing with the coronavirus. Corona, the current coronavirus, COVID-19, is still a pandemic, despite what you may have heard in the news, it is still a pandemic. Um, and it, while it's different, you know, it's going to continue transitioning on from the acute pandemic where we had no no way to do anything. We were just learning about it. We had nothing but what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions to deal with it. So that's closure, isolation, quarantine. Um, but now we have a lot more tools, which always makes public health happy when there's more to do. Vaccination, we have their treatments um, and those along with some of the, the lesser mitigation like wearing masks really can have an impact. An outbreak is something where it is just you have a disease in the community and it it's, is above normal. So that can also be like a mini epidemic, we can call it. So um, the, it's anything expected above the norm. So you can imagine that right now with COVID, um, we're not calling this a COVID outbreak because we've been in high transmission for so long. Monkeypox was an outbreak when we just had it in 2003 and then we had it again um, while we're still having it. But that is an outbreak because you would expect no monkeypox and then you have monkeypox. Smallpox, same thing. If we were to see a smallpox case, um, well, I don't, even want, I don't even want to think about that. But that would one case would be, you know, a, an, a, an outbreak, an epidemic and 
cause for much alarm. Whereas with influenza, we can have, you know, hundreds of cases and depending on um, where we are in, in the cycle, it might not be considered even an outbreak. An epidemic is the same type of thing. It's when the disease affects a large number of people within a community or population or region. So um, there have been lots of examples of epidemics uh, throughout the years. Um, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, luckily a lot of those are um, vaccine preventable, but we also have things that come around like, um, uh, well, I can't think of anything right now, but you know, the they're diseases that um, can spring up. They can either emerge or reemerge and um, cause problems uh, because they're so widespread, but not as widespread as a pandemic, which pandemic means worldwide spread. So spread over multiple continents or countries, uh, we're still having that. So, And then one other thing is reservoirs. So this is places where the path pathogens re reside. So um, these can be living or non-living sites. So they can they can be within um, a person, for example, like um, a disease that can stay within a person and or an animal, or it could be something um, where it's in the dirt, it's in the soil, um, like anthrax or something like that can can be that type of thing. Okay, so I'm real quickly going to talk about transmission routes because this is a big part of of how we address things. Um, so you have your, and this is the also the reason why there is such a big difference between COVID-19, which of course is, is um, uh, airborne and it is uh, extremely infectious versus something like monkeypox, which while shocking that that came up, we knew that we would be able to get a handle on it because um, of the way that transmits. And so con there's contact um, transmission that's person to person. So that's um, touching, kissing, sex, droplets. Uh, vertical is mother to child. Horizontal is uh, like mucous membranes. Um, droplet, that would be respiratory spread less than three meters. And then indirect, or uh, that's something on fomites or like inanimate objects. That's why we tell you to, um, with certain diseases, we tell you to make sure that you clean commonly touched surfaces because the, the pathogens can live on surfaces sometimes. Um, vehicle transmission, that's your foodborne, your waterborne, um, fine particles, which are uh, aerosolized. Um, so that would be something like hantavirus or TB. So it's, it's um, hantavirus is a, an interesting one. Um, and we actually had a, an outbreak in our community of soul hantavirus. Um, and it was transmitted through uh, pet rats, but it was transmitted um, here through the, like a bite or it can always be transmitted that way, but it was really transmitted through aerosolized particles. So the, the rat urine or feces um, becomes aerosolized either through cleaning cages or cleaning up <clears throat> or through um, getting on something and, and going into the air, like in dust or something like that. <clears throat> a vector, uh, we talk about vectors a lot in public health. These are typically the arthropods that carry pathogen from one host to the other. So, you know, you know, disease, some diseases are spread by mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, mites, kissing bugs, biting flies. Um, <clears throat> certainly in our uh, area, the biggest is mosquitoes. Um, we have mosquitoes that can transmit um, West Nile virus. We also have mosquitoes that can transmit Zika virus and, and other things. And then of course, ticks. Ticks transmit all kinds of things. And they can also, um, they can also transmit certain diseases that we don't typically think of as, um, as a tick-borne disease like um, tularemia, for example. Um, animals can be uh, transmission routes, uh, specifically rabies, tularemia, also known as rabbit fever. You can um, certainly be infected by those. We have cases of rabies in bats all the time um, in, in Illinois. We do a surveillance. If someone finds a bat in their home, uh, we like to get a hold of that bat and get it tested um, so that that can prevent, hopefully, someone from having unnecessary um, uh, 
post-exposure prophylaxis. But I will tell you, if you ever wake up in your in your bedroom or your home, you wake up and there's a bat in your home, you will be, if we can't get a hold of that bat and send it for testing, you will be getting um, rabies uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. And that's because the bat's bites are so tiny and unnoticeable that um, often people are bitten without realizing it. Um, make it difficult for some people possibly to sleep tonight. I apologize for that. I do have kind of a weird, a weird sense of things that I talk about that don't bother me, but sometimes bother others. Um, and then we also know about healthcare associated infections, and those have been rising um, over the years. You will hear about, you know, C. diff and and some fungal um, illnesses that are transmitted within healthcare facilities and. Um, you know, other illnesses like that. So in Illinois, these, I'm going to show the, the reportable diseases. Um, a lot of times you're not even going to hear about these diseases, but that doesn't mean that we are not seeing cases of them. Sometimes they're imported from another area. Sometimes uh, they're not. But we, when we get any one of these diseases, we have a whole uh, list of things that we have to do to follow up with them. And when I say reportable diseases, that means that these diseases are mandated, reported to the local health department. Um, some of them within, you know, immediate, we have to get an immediate call, some of them up to seven days. So it depends on the, the potential um, severity of it and the potential for spread and the unusualness of it and all kinds of things. But we know what those are and the hospitals and clinics and labs know what those are. And um, we get as soon as we get a, a, um, a report of it, then that communicable disease investigators like spring into action and we work on it, which I'll show you in a minute. So we have, these are available to look at on the internet too, if, if you're interested. Um, it is, we, they are pretty fascinating. So we have the vector vehicle ones and those are, you can see a lot of those are spread by, um, by bugs, by uh, ticks or you, ticks or mosquitoes. Then we have the water, the food and waterborne. Um, when we work with those, you know, we bring in like communicable disease division, the environmental health division. Sometimes we have to get state engineering involved. Sometimes we have to get the EPA involved. These are things that um, are, you know, spreading potentially in, in our water or food. Because we are on a um, municipal water system, in most of our county, we don't see a lot of this, but the people can get it from, you can also get it from sometimes from food. So that's mostly where we would see it. Uh, vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, these are ones that, um, you know, luckily, oops, luckily we don't see a lot of that, um, but we see too much of it because they're vaccine preventable we shouldn't be seeing any of it or very rare, you know, imported cases. But um, so you'll see in probably a lot of you don't even realize that you get diphtheria, that you have diphtheria vaccination. Um, in the tetanus shots now is tetanus, we call them tetanus shots still, but it's tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis are in those. Um, measles, mumps, rubella are together in a, in a vaccine. Um, we still have polio vaccine. And, and you can see how when there is... A, a decline in vaccination that these these will rise up again. You can see with polio in in New York. I never thought in my um, career I would see um, polio popping up because people aren't getting vaccinated for it. And then of course uh, there's smallpox, which is vaccine preventable, but it's also been eradicated naturally, not naturally, but naturally occurring smallpox has been eradicated. Um, it is still out there in a couple of labs and um, there is always the potential that is scary, but there's always the potential for, you know, that to be released as a, either through a bioterror or a bio error um, type of event. So smallpox, while we don't typically think of it in, you know, day to day, world, uh, public health still thinks about it. Then we have the sexually transmitted diseases. Um, those have, we have had new ones since, you know, I've uh, been working in public health. Um, every once in a while, something strange will happen. And while we don't show monkeypox on here as sexually transmitted, 
it, they are still looking at that to see if that is one of the ways that it can be spread. And when I say sexually transmitted, I mean through uh, body fluids, not through contact. So they're still, you know, checking that out. And it, it may actually become one. We just don't know. And then environmental, um, Staph aurea, Strep A, uh, these are the things, CRE, these are things that we see um, sometimes in hospitals or nursing homes, uh, places like that. Okay. Um, then I'm just showing you real quickly who we work with when we do this. So if we have a vector or vehicle born, we usually get um, our communicable disease division here, uh, environmental health. We use uh, the experts over at Vet Med and entomology at the U of I a lot. They're very helpful and, and we're very lucky to have them in our community and to be so accessible to us. Of food and waterborne outbreaks, it'll be our CD and EH divisions. And like I said, engineering EPA sometimes. Um, vaccine preventable, we use our communicable disease. Uh, we use nurses and then clinic logistics. Um, we have had to do lots of large scale uh, mass vaccination campaigns. COVID was one, H1N1. Um, we've had mumps outbreak at the U of I that we've done, meningitis outbreak. So we've, we have a lot of experience doing those. Um, sexually transmitted diseases, we use um, CD staff, but mostly we have STD specific staff um, for that. And then environmental health and environmental infection, we would work with a, a variety of, of places as well, sometimes even OSHA. Um, I just want to show you uh, uh, some of the pandemics throughout history and to show you where uh, COVID is in that history. Um, you can see that what's known as the Black Death or bubonic plague, that was the big one. Um, you know, so many deaths from that, but it also, you know, went on for several years. There, It was obviously a completely different time. There weren't a lot of things they could do for it. Um, and it was spread initially by um, the, the fleas on the rats. And then uh, it probably became pneumonic at some point during that. You see smallpox was, it, smallpox is just the big horror. That's the, that's the really scary one. And then you see what you always hear about the 1918 uh 1919 uh, Spanish flu pandemic, and you can see how many it killed. And it goes all the way down. And down here is the initial little SARS that happened in 2002, 2003. And uh, that is tiny in comparison. That could have taken off. MERS could have taken off. You know, these could have taken off and become much, you know, much wider uh, pandemics. SARS was the scary one. Um, I think everyone believed that that was had a good chance, but it was it was shut down early. Unfortunately, that didn't happen uh, with COVID-19 and it was more transmissible and it just took off. So you can see how quickly um, a pandemic can can take off from not even knowing about it to that. And I was trying to see in here. Here's the 2000 the swine flu win in 2009. Um, I don't know why they call it swine flu. I find that very irritating when when places refer to it. All flu is basically coming from usually from birds or through uh, pigs. That's not uncommon at all. That's how they that's how it works. But so this would be down here, your H1N1. Um, and you see, even though that was a pandemic and you saw how fast it happened, you can see it was much less virulent. And we had, you know, the deaths were around 200,000 worldwide. Every time I talk about COVID, um, I have to update. Unfortunately, I have to keep updating the deaths. We're now at 6.53 million deaths. Um, due to this, and 1.05 million of those are in the U.S. alone, which I still have difficulty wrapping my head around. Um, we have had, uh, when do, what did we have in Illinois? 34,935 deaths as of today, and we stand at 306 um, deaths from COVID in Champaign County, which is, you know, just way, way too many. Um, and it's ongoing. We're still seeing in the U.S., you know, four to five hundred deaths a day from COVID. So it is not over. Um, 
it's it's probably not going to become endemic for you know some models showed like 2024 it may become endemic by then all right so uh, coronaviruses i just wanted to show you that, that you know coronaviruses have been out there for a very very long time um, they started out probably all of these started out as either at you know probably at least epidemics and they could have who knows when they originated but we have the first four that you see there um, are actually coronaviruses that cause what we call the common cold. There is no such thing as a cold. Um, a common cold is a bunch of different viruses. You can either, right now in our community, we have um, inter uh, adenoviruses circulating. You can get rhinoviruses, coronaviruses. So there are all kinds out there. And then below that, you see that we saw MERS, well, SARS actually happened first, and then MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, um, and then boom, uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, which it's actually referred to, that's what the virus is called. What are some of the things that CUPHD has responded to over the years? You know, we deal with foodborne outbreaks a, a lot of the time. Um, norovirus is the most common. That's what people call stomach flu. There is no such thing as stomach flu because flu means influenza. I always like to get that little plug in there. But norovirus is, is often what's causing that. Um, it's very infectious. You hear about it on cruise ships and we have outbreaks in the community all the time. Um, staph, uh, that's a foodborne outbreak you don't want to see. We've had some, I won't get into it, but we've had some community outbreaks uh, long before I was here that were legendary, uh, salmonella. And a lot of times these are not, um, these foodborne outbreaks, you know, people think that um, they're necessarily, may be caused by the restaurant or the, their, their handling of food at their own home. That used to be much more the case, but now the way we grow some vegetables, and you know that we've, we've seen this with like romaine lettuce and, and things that sometimes the, and sprouts, and sometimes it's the actual um, product that's contaminated. It's not contaminated in the setting where it's, where it's cooked, but it's contaminated before that. Um, we've had cowpox outbreak here. We had the distinction of being the only human case of cowpox in North America. Um, I won't get into that one. You can always uh, Google it and look in the medical journals if you're interested. Um, monkeypox. We had monkeypox back in 2003. Hardly anyone seems to remember it, but we did. And it was caused at the time by pet prairie dogs, uh, which... I did not know there was a such thing as pet prairie dogs. Um, Sol hantavirus outbreak, which I talked about earlier, was caused by pet rats. Um, I was also not aware of the rat um, industry, the rat um, breeders for pets. Um, that was really interesting. Um, tularemia, we've had, we've had that. Um, we've actually had some very serious cases and a death in our community due to that. Tularemia or rabbit fever is um, especially dangerous if you breathe it in. So what happens sometimes is that people can run over a, a diseased rabbit carcass in their yard and, and not even know it while they're doing yard work. And um, that can be aerosolized. And um, while it's treatable, a lot of times people don't um, get treated soon enough. Uh, West Nile virus, we know about that. Um, HIV, AIDS, COVID, and H1N1 pandemics. Those are the three I've worked on in my career, and it better be the last one. Uh, Zika, that, you know, that was another one that just popped up. Um, Ebola, these are all things that, that we've had to deal with. Ebola, what we did with that is it was a reportable disease, but it was also associated. So if someone had traveled to where the outbreak was and they came back to the US, they were followed by public health for the entire incubation period. So we would have to meet with, meet with the individuals and have them test their temperature multiple times a day. Um, COVID-19, mumps, we had a, a mumps outbreak, which is especially distressing to me as that is a vaccine preventable disease. Hepatitis A, uh, that is a foodborne, usually a foodborne outbreak, and those are very serious. Um, they can, they are very difficult to mitigate because um, 
if they are done in, in something like a, a large restaurant. One of the ones in Illinois was at a McDonald's over in uh, the Quincy area, and um, they had to try to locate everyone who had eaten there over a time period. Very difficult. Um, pertussis or whooping cough, that's made a comeback. We hadn't seen that in years and years and years. TB, we still deal with a lot of tuberculosis, which again, I thought we probably, when I started in public health, I thought the TB would probably not be something we would have to deal with, but we deal with it a lot. Uh, meningitis, very scary. Um, there's a vaccine for that now, luckily, um, but it's a very, very scary um, illness. And when it breaks out, uh, often it's associated with college campuses or congregate settings. Uh, we have to move really quickly um, to get vaccination and, and things for that. Uh, smallpox vaccination, we actually have done smallpox vaccination here uh, where you use the bifurcated needle, you dip it in the, in the, um, the vaccine and you stab the arm. Um, it's more of the old school way to do it. Now, we did that after 9-11 when we had to prepare staff in case there was a, um, a bioterrorist event with smallpox. And then now we use, people don't know this, but the monkeypox vaccine, it's not really a monkeypox vaccine, it's a smallpox vaccine because they're both orthopox viruses and it works for that. So um, now we have a smallpox vaccine called Genios that is just like a, a regular vaccine. And we can even, even give it um, intradermally under the skin like a TB test. So um, that allows us to, to save doses to be able to uh, make it go further. And I talked briefly about bioterror and bioerror because it, a release of something can happen either intentionally or unintentionally. And that's what I mean by bio error. So those are things that if a case of this pops up, we are going to be highly, um, highly alert. Uh, there's a lot to do with that, even though it can be totally, you know, totally not caused by anything. We've seen cases of anthrax and, and uh, botulism and plague and tularemia and none of them are associated with bioterror. So, you know, anthrax is, is naturally, well, not naturally occurring, but it's occurring in the soil. It's almost ubiquitous in some soil. And uh, tularemia can, is around and it periodically pops up its head. But if it, they are weaponized, uh, they can be uh, obviously much more uh, concerning. So I just want to end with the, something like how vulnerable are we in the U.S.? right now. Um, and it it's something that, you know, public health, we think about this a lot. Um, and what is really concerning to me about COVID is that a large part of the U.S. Pump population just, just refused to do any COVID uh, mitigation strategies, even though we were extremely lucky to have access to this in the United States when other parts of the world would, you know, really, really appreciate that and need that. Um, but it's, it concerns me that what if we had something that was a, a, a biologic attack of some sort of biologic agent that has been released? That concerns me um, that, that bad actors in other parts of the world now know that um, a large part of the, the United States simply would, would not listen to public health um, community, and I'm talking about World Health Organization, CDC on down, wouldn't wouldn't listen to that. And that that makes us, in my opinion, much more vulnerable. Um, so, and that is, that is the end of my little presentation here. So I have my email on here. I always welcome questions from people. Um, I am the luckiest person to have this job in this community. It is an amazing community to work in. Um, I have never seen so much uh, cooperation and, um, you know, interest in public health, and it's, it's wonderful. So um, I see my phone number's on there wrong, too. My phone number is 531-5369, not 7. You can tell I make my own slides, so <laughs> I don't prove them well. So I'm available. If anyone has any questions, I will have Patrick ask them. Yeah, thank you very much, Julie. I really appreciate, um, you know, I, I learned a ton there, you know, in just a very short amount of time, you know, a lot of 
really good things. Also, some things that you know I didn't know about. You know, a nice little fun fact of having the only cowpox case in in North America. You know, here and and um, you know when you mentioned that uh, the original monkeypox outbreak in 2003, I also didn't know that pet prairie dogs were a thing. So that's uh, nope. <laughs> I, I, I guess that's out there. And um, you know, also you know, thanks. I like you said, I probably won't be able to sleep tonight. I didn't know that about the bats. You know, and their small bites and that sort of thing. So I'm going to have to go check all corners of the bedroom and our very, kids very treatable. Well. Yeah. yeah. If you, if you find a bat, call, call someone to come get the bat for you. Call animal control and get the bat out of there. Public health will get it. We'll pick it up. We'll get it tested and, and then hopefully uh, prevent any problems. Okay. Um, so uh, got time here for maybe just a, a few questions. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but um but uh, uh, if you have any questions, put those down in the comment section. Uh, we can ask that you we can answer those here at the end. Uh, just to start off, Julie, um, uh, for me, I, I'm always interested to see um, what motivates what motivates folks to get into their line of work. So, were you always like? Did you grow up, you know, as a child, always interested in getting into healthcare or public health or that sort of thing, or um, you know? It, what uh, what motivated you to to get into this field initially, if you, if you mind me asking? Well, it was HIV AIDS. Um, so what happened is I was uh, I had no I was always a, a little a bit of a, a science nerd. I loved all the you know, I loved everything about animals, environment, uh, science as a kid. But I was actually a commercial artist. And when HIV AIDS happened and I saw um, how people were being treated um, in the news. And I was just horrified by that. And I thought I could do that. That's not, that isn't scary. Why are they treating people like that? And long story short, I just quit working in advertising. I came to the U of I, I said to them, I, I want to work with people that have AIDS. They shuffled me around till I got to the school of social work and the school of social work hooked me up with Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, where I worked with Joan Lathrop. And um, she was the only one uh, that was doing anything with HIV AIDS, her and a group with GCAP, a Greater Community AIDS Project. And I, that's how it happened. And I, by all of my work as somebody who knew nothing about infectious diseases, um, just trying to learn about HIV AIDS in a way that I could communicate it to others um, locally led me to, you know, learning about all the opportunistic infections people get. And then I, I, I just became fascinated with it and I was pulled in and I've loved every single minute of it. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's, there's so many different, uh, you know, things, you know, you know, with our local public health district that I was unaware of that you all, um, uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and offer to the community, you know, and I, I learned a whole bunch, you know, tonight just for that as well. So it looks like um, I'm sure that uh, there is never an identical day um, on the job for you. Um, so that, that always makes things. That's, and that, that is what I love about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Susan asked a question, I think potentially referencing COVID-19 how do you address the people who believe in herd immunity for themselves or their children? If you have an answer to that one, Julie. Well, I mean, I always just try to get, um, I always just try to get as much information out there as possible. And I just try to make myself available um, to talk to individuals. And if they're not comfortable talking with me um, in this amazing community, I can hook them up with an infectious disease person, if that's their question, a pedi pediatrician. I mean, we have so many people in this community. We, you know, U of I virologists, uh, we have epidemiologists, we have uh, all, it just, you know, with the university here, we have all kinds of things. But the, the key, I think, is just to let people know that we really do, you know, care. People who work in public health, we really do care. And we want to see um, people happy, healthy, and safe, basically. And if there's something that we can do to that, we're just to help with that, we're just going to keep doing it. We're all about prevention. Um, we're never going to make everybody um, understand or or want to be vaccinated. But um, 
we need to just keep putting out correct information and trying to explain, you know, just be transparent and explain how we do things and why we do things. Um, you all got to see how the sausage was made during COVID because normally, you know, we haven't really had that in, in my lifetime where you, well, that's not true. We did with HIV, um, but you don't usually see um, something that just pops on the, the scene that there is really um, no template there, you know, to work with. So what you have to do is you work with what you have before. Um, and we just tried, you know, all through the pandemic, I just tried to let people know that, you know, we're here, um, we're, it, we're ready to answer any question um, or get the answer for them, because we certainly don't know all the answers. And just to keep trying to explain, you know, what it is we do, why we do it, but we really do um, want to see uh, happier, healthier communities. And um, so when, when that's kind of your goal, and that's, that's a pretty good goal. You know, it's a, pre it's a pretty good thing. We have a great mission here and the people that work here um, buy into that mission. That's, that's what we do. And it just becomes public health kind of gets in your, kind of gets in your system and it, and so. Okay. Um, well, thanks for that, Julie. Um, I have a, I have another question, um, you know, as we're, you know, living through, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic still, and, you know, you've, you've lived through it in a pretty unique perspective as administrator of a local public health district and, and worked through, you know, many of these other outbreaks and, you know, epidemics and, 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 and pandemics in your work and, and in public health. Is there anything, you know, if you could, you know, pick one or maybe a few, uh, you know, uh, things that we've learned from uh, current pandemic that you hope are applied to the future, you know, in, in doing this exhibit at the uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie, you know, we look at, you know, these previous outbreaks, epidemics and pandemics and, and what worked or maybe what didn't work, you know, a long time ago. And as you said, we kind of, you know, learn from what happens before and then apply that to the future. Do you have any things? I, I, abs I absolutely do. It is my hope and my wish um, that we learn from COVID. We're already preparing for the next pandemic that I hope is long down the road, but public health can only do so much. You know, we we have the, the same tools have been being used, you know, epidemiology has been being used since Jon Snow took the pump handle off of the well, you know, <laughs> in London. Um, so we, we have our tools, but what we have to have, if we're ever going to um, stop ha seeing these pandemics is we need to, people to understand the, the one health um, concept of human health, animal, you know, it's a triad, human health, animal health, environmental health, they are all tied together and they absolutely impact each other. And we have got to, we have got to start dealing with inequity because inequity and poverty, those are the things that will forever keep um, pandemics, epidemics, everything from being far worse than they need to be. So if we have learned anything, we should be able to, see, I mean, we all lived it. We could see that some people, you know, made billions of dollars during the pandemic and others were struggling to eat. Um, so I always like to use this um, quote from uh, Bill Fogue, who used to work for the CDC. Um, it is that public health, a social justice is the foundation of public health. While um, epidemiology may be our, our, scientific, um, our scientific base, it's really social justice that is, you know, is our philosophical base. If we do not continue to um, address issues of inequality, not just here, worldwide, we are going to just continue to see all of these um, diseases and all of these problems made far, far worse. Thank you, Julie. Really, uh, really appreciate the answer, and you know, I, uh, right there with you as well. So, thank you. Um, uh, looks like we're not getting any more uh, questions coming in at this moment, but we are getting some thank yous. You know, Paul says thank you, Julie. Um, uh, Susan also says thank you. Paul says excellent points here. So, you know, I would I would agree with all of those. And you know, with that, uh, it's getting close to eight o'clock here. 
we'll um, we'll wrap it up. So I want to thank you, Julie, again for for joining us tonight, um, providing an excellent presentation um, with a lot of content, a lot of information, and then also just thank you for everything that you do for the community here, um, you know, here in the CU area. And, um, and, you know, especially we appreciate your support at the Museum of the Grand Prairie with our, you know, recent exhibit. Everybody get out there and see that exhibit. It's fabulous. You guys did an amazing job. And and thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. It was it was certainly my pleasure. Yeah. and and. Thanks to Julie and you know, uh, you know, other community organizations like CUPHD. We couldn't have done the exhibit without them, and we have such a great community here, as Julie um, mentioned several times um, in, in her presentation. So, with that, you know, I'll thank all the viewers out there, whether you're watching this live or potentially recorded. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Hope we can uh, see you at some of our future virtual or in-person programs, or just coming out to the museum, as Julie said. Uh, check out our new exhibit and other spaces. So. With that, good night, everybody, and um, until next time, going to end the live broadcast. Good night.